Cultivating self-love. This is a very vast topic with a lot of information that I can convey. And so I've broken it into, I think, three parts. Um, and this is part one. Um, it may end up being six parts. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I wish to speak about this because of this perception right here. This is something that I've come to find in my work as a, as a counselor. Um, and it's that the absence of self-love is the root cause of mental, spiritual, and physical health issues and is the result of traumatic experiences. Um, shame being the, the, the main traumatic experience that we come out of um, throughout our lives when, when things don't go how we'd hope they do or we experience things that um, are traumatic. We then experience shame and shame is the opposite of self-love. Shame is the belief that you're bad and self-hatred, stuff like that. And so we're gonna be talking about how to get away from that and towards more love for yourself. Now, throughout this, I'll be using kind of the, um, the perspective of a model of counseling that's called internal family systems. Anyone heard of it before? Yeah. Okay, cool. So if, if, if you can imagine like a family, you know, mother, father, daughter, son, and Every member of that family contributes to the overall system. And if one member of that family is dysfunctional, well then the whole family is affected. And now if you can take that model and think of yourself as a family, all in one, right? You're comprised of many parts, and if any of those parts are dysfunctional, then the whole system becomes dysfunctional. Okay, so a system is comprised of multiple parts that make up the whole. You are a system of parts that make up your whole self. You know, we have the, the, the part of me that gets angry when somebody cuts me off when I'm driving. That's a part of me. Now, if I was to hate that part because of its reaction, well, then I'm not doing myself any good. I have to bring that part in close to me and give it love because that part of me is just as deserving of love as any other part of me. So you cannot banish a part of you. You have to instead learn to love and integrate each of those parts. Anyone have a part of themselves that they don't like? Part of themselves that they've said, that's not me anymore, I'm not that person. Well, yeah, you are, but you don't have to let that part drive the bus, okay? What parts of you have you tried to banish? And are you ready to pull that part of yourself in close and give it the love it needs so that the whole system begins to function as a whole all loved by you. Now, what is self-love? That's, that's, that's actually a pretty hard question to answer for a lot of people. Because, you know, if, if I was just to sit here and say, well, I mean, the answer is to start loving yourself. Okay, <laughs> what does that mean? Does that mean I take bubble baths every day or, you know, go get my nails done? I, I don't know. So, self-love is many things, but one, it's having a deep sense of appreciation respect and care for yourself. Again, when you have a part of yourself that seems to cause a lot of trouble in your life, it's hard to have a deep sense of appreciation, respect and care for that self. But what we don't realize is those parts of ourselves that we don't really like or that seem to cause us problems play a role. For a lot of people, it's a protector. It's, it's this part of myself, okay? The part of myself that gets angry if somebody cuts me off, that part of myself is like, in a way trying to protect me from anyone taking advantage of me, disrespecting me, things like that. But it's also messing with my overall feelings of peace because somebody cuts me off, that part takes over, drives the bus into a brick wall, and then I'm left there being angry all day because of the actions of another person. That's not really serving me. Self-love is also recognizing your worth accepting your flaws, and prioritizing your physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual health. We've talked a lot about prioritizing yourself in the last two times that I've uh, presented. And it is my belief that, that you're number one, like plain and simple. In your life, you are number one. You have to take care of yourself before you can take care of anybody else. And many of us were raised to believe that's called selfishness. And I think there's two kinds of selfish. You know, if, if uh, Kevin and I were to decide we're going to get a pizza and share a pizza together and we both split the cost, whatever, we get the pizza, Kevin gets up and goes to the bathroom, he comes back and I ate all the pizza. <laughs> that's a dick move, you know, like that's selfish, right? But if, if I have a bad back and Kevin asks me to help him move, 
I'm, I'm going to tell them no. And that's also selfish. And Kevin could say, man, I thought you were my friend. I'll be like, I am your friend, but I also care about myself and I'm going to take care of myself. Okay. Boundaries. Self-love is also treating yourself with kindness, setting healthy boundaries, like what I just said, and not seeking external validation. What does external validation look like for each of you? I know for me, it's uh, looking for somebody to tell me I'm good when I'm in that place of shame, having those thoughts that I'm not good. You know, and that may be um, through sex, through alcohol, through substances, through anything. That validation can become, I mean, you can look to a, an animal to give you validation. And that in and of itself can become a toxic thing if like, what happens if that animal dies? And that's where you got your sense of self, your, your validation from, and now it's no longer there. So you have to develop that within yourself. Self-love is also embracing who you are, being mindful of your needs, and practicing self-compassion. Self-compassion, that can be a tough one. And self-love leads to increased confidence, resilience, and overall life satisfaction. How many in here can say that you are absolutely satisfied with how your life is, with how it's, how it's gone, everything that's ever happened, there's no hands in the air, nobody? Okay, that's okay. We're, we're getting there, we're working towards it, right? I could say that at this point in my life, I, I, I do feel overall life satisfaction. It's not because I've never done anything bad or had difficult moments or anything. It's because I literally do my best to live my life with the idea that everything that I've experienced, whether I perceive it as good or bad, has contributed to who I am today. And I think I'm a pretty fucking awesome person. So <laughs> that's, I'm, I'm happy about that, you know? That's where the life satisfaction comes from. If, if somebody who knew me 10 years ago was to hear me say that, they'd be like, how? How in the world can you be satisfied with all the things you've done? That's where shame comes from, guys. And some, a lot of us have the voice in the back of our head that says that crap over and over and over and over again. Self-love seeks to overcome that voice and become the voice that's louder, that says, I'm okay, I'm safe, I'm protected. What I've done has contributed to who I am today and I'm thankful. So learning to love yourself. Learning to love yourself is an ongoing process that requires self-awareness, compassion, and intentional practice. It involves embracing your strengths and imperfections while cultivating a positive and nurturing relationship with yourself. Today we'll cover the following three of 10 practical steps to cultivating self-love. That's where the part two and part three and possibly part 12 come in. <laughs> so again, we'll be practicing, we'll be talking today about practicing self-awareness and acceptance, challenging negative self-talk and practicing self-compassion. I like this picture. When I was looking for a picture to, to put in this, in this specific slide, that one came across and I was like, that's perfect. You know, but how many of you, if you look in the mirror, do you see the lion? How many look in the mirror and see Nothing. I've, I've worked with clients before that wouldn't even look in the mirror because they didn't like how looking at themselves made them feel. And then when you ask a client like that to imagine themselves in their head during a meditation, they find it very difficult, right? And so your self-perception is an important part of your self-awareness and of cultivating self-love. So in order to begin self-reflection, you start by becoming more aware of your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. We've talked about that in the last two presentations that I've done um, because your thoughts, your beliefs, your words, all of that contributes not only to creating the reality around you, but to cultivating the love for yourself that we're looking for. Are your thoughts con condemning? Do they tell you how bad you are? Do they tell you how unworthy of love you are? Or do they tell you how awesome you are? And I'm not saying awesome in an arrogant type way. It, you know, it's okay to talk about yourself. It's okay to you know, tell people what you're proud of. It's okay to speak those things because it's a heck of a lot better than speaking negative things about yourself. You know, I use the example like people that say nothing ever goes my way. It's not gonna get you anywhere. And not only is that, not com is that coming out of their mouth, but how much do you think it's running through their head? Everywhere they look, nothing ever goes their way. And that comes out of their mouth and, and, and manifests itself in their beliefs. And it, so it takes self-awareness and self-reflection to start changing those things. If you have a thought 
if you pay attention, a lot of people, and sometimes I'm guilty of this too still, but you'll think about what you don't want a lot more than you think about what you do want. You'll plan your whole day around avoiding what you don't want instead of running towards what you do. So in this self-awareness, this practice of, of becoming aware of your thoughts, your beliefs, your words, your emotions, all of this stuff, you notice any patterns of self-criticism, perfectionism, or negative self-talk. Some people think that perfectionism is a good thing. You know, they're like, it, it keeps me accountable. It keeps me moving forward. But it also shames you when you mess up. It also tells you you're not good enough when you make a mistake. It doesn't allow for humanity. So then, the other side of this is accepting imperfections. Now, if you're somebody who thinks that they have no imperfections, that can be good and bad. Again, you know, going back to the arrogant thing, but I mean, <laughs> I think of arrogance as if I'm using my speech and thoughts and, and stuff to compare myself to another person. If I say, oh, I'm way better at this than my wife is. Like, that's arrogance that kind of has some negative connotation to it because it, it, it's comparing. It's putting someone else down in order to lift yourself up. But if I go to my wife and I say, hey, I feel like a badass today. Like, I did this, I did this, I did this. And she's like, yeah, babe, go. You, that's not arrogance. That's like self-love. That's lifting yourself up, putting yourself in a place where you're you're, you're happy about yourself and happy about what you've done and excited and, and proud of it. So understand that no one is perfect and it's okay to have flaws. It's okay to have flaws. There's, I, I, I strive daily to, if I start feeling an emotion that's uncomfortable, anger, sadness, jealousy, anything like that, to sit with that for a minute and just be aware of it. And I think in the last year, there's been a few times where after I feel something, I'll go to my wife and I'll be like, hey, I'm, I'm sorry that I was irritable for this amount of time because, you know, for whatever reason, I was giving this uh, meaning to whatever, whatever it was and that meaning made me feel that way, you know? But that's mine, that's mine to own. It's not her fault that she said something or her fault that she did something, it's mine. And that can be considered a flaw, you know? Or it can also be considered human. Accepting yourself as you are rather than striving for an unattainable ideal builds the foundation for self-love. In my practice, um, I, 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 my schedule stays full. I do pretty well. But every now and then, you know, I have a client that comes for like one session or two sessions and then they just like ghost me. I don't hear nothing from them. They don't show up for their next session. And sometimes I struggle with the idea that that's my fault. Like I did something wrong. I wasn't there enough. I didn't you say the right things or whatever, but that is an unattainable ideal for me. You know, there's, there's a lot of the way that I practice that may not be for everybody. You know, I, uh, I, I, can, I think that I practice pretty bluntly, but sometimes I'm not sure that that's the best for each individual person, but still, that's not my fault. I mean, it's not my fault that they didn't come back, you know? If, that's, if I'm being my authentic, true self, and they, they don't come back because maybe that's too much or something, I don't know. Or maybe they just had something going on in their life and it had absolutely nothing to do with me. That's probably the case. <laughs> anyway, not setting yourself up thinking that you have to be perfect helps build the, the foundation for self-love. And you can acknowledge both your strengths and your weaknesses without judgment. That's called vulnerability. We talked about that yesterday in, in our uh, second podcast episode. Mm -hmm. And vulnerability is, is <laughs> it's kind of a new thing for especially men. Um, learning to, to be vulnerable and say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm really struggling with the weight of the world on my shoulders and I don't want to appear weak or like I don't have my stuff together. And so I just hold it all in. But if you can acknowledge like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm I have a tendency to like get angry when this, this, and this happens, or I have a tendency to assume that when you do this, this, and this, that it means that I'm not doing a good job or that I'm not good enough. And you could say that's a weakness, but the beautiful thing is that you can acclimate that weakness into strength because being vulnerable 
not only facilitates intimacy, but it lifts that weight off your shoulders so that you do become stronger. So this is the second point, challenging negative self-talk. If any of you have heard me speak before, you know that I talk about beliefs a lot because I do believe that your beliefs form everything around you. Your beliefs are the, 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 the thing that creates your life. And so if you have negative beliefs, this goes back to the first agreement of Don Miguel Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements, be impeccable with your word. If you're able to identify negative beliefs, then you're able to start moving in a direction where the things that come out of your mouth aren't things that are gonna hurt your life. They're not gonna hurt other people, but they're gonna build your life up. They're gonna build other people up. They're gonna cultivate self-love. So pay attention to the internal dialogue you have about yourself. What's going on in there? What's going on in that head? And when those things are going on, you know, if you, if you have ruminating thoughts about how bad you are, about how you shouldn't have done this 15 years ago, or about how you ruined your life at this point and you, there's no overcoming it, talk to somebody about it. Let that out. Because those thoughts are just going to keep going and going and going and going and going until you expose them. We talk about shadow, Carl Jung um, in shadow work. The shadow is the aspect of self that you hide, repress, and deny. And for a lot of us, that shadow comes in the form of negative self-talk. But the minute you get it out, you shine a light on that shadow, it loses its power, and then you can integrate it to actually, again, acclimate to become a positive force in your life instead of a negative force. You can use that negative internal dialogue as the opposite of what you do want. So if in your head you're, you're hearing, you know, I'm stupid, I'm stupid, I'm stupid. Well, I don't want to be stupid. I don't want to say stupid things. So what can I replace that thought with? I am intelligent. I am wise. I am able. Plenty of, plenty of alternatives there. And at first, you may, it may feel like you're kind of not being honest with yourself. But eventually, it'll start to take root. And you'll start feeling what it feels like to be intelligent and able and confident. So are you often critical, judgmental, or harsh? Recognize these thoughts as irrational beliefs rather than facts. I know for me, a lot of the critical, judgmental, and harsh language that may ruminate in my head comes from my upbringing in, in strict Christianity. You know, it was, it was a constant evaluating myself of whether or not my actions, my thoughts, my words were worthy of God, worthy of love, worthy of sac the sacrifice that was, you know, supposedly made for me, okay? And you can replace them with positive affirmations. Now, I am statements. Affirmations and I am statements are kind of the same thing, okay? But I am statements, to me, we add an extra oomph to it. Okay, because it's, it's my belief that God is everything. You, me, the floor, the chairs you're sitting on, everything. Like nothing that we can perceive is not source, not the infinite energies, God, whatever we want to call it. And so now here's where part of my upbringing in Christianity kind of comes in and, and gave me a tool, right? When, when Moses asked God, what do I have the people call you? God said, I am that I am. And to me, that was amazing because that's saying, I am, insert any word you want to, and that defines or expresses what source is. And so when I say I am, I am invoking that divinity within me and claiming that aspect or that characteristic in my life. I'm already that thing. And by saying I am confident, I'm stepping into it. And I'm saying, I am confident. And every time I say it, I step in a little more. And I get closer and closer and closer to, to, to radiating confidence. And if any of you knew me six years ago, that's the proof that this works. Because I was, I could, there was no way in hell I'd be standing up here talking to a bunch of people without, you know, shaking or even being able to. And it was just because I wasn't confident in what I was saying. I grew up in a lot of ways being told that I didn't, that, what I had to say wasn't important and no one wanted to hear it. And that the only thing I ever said was hurtful to people. And so saying I am confident, I am safe, I am secure, I am wise, all of those things has created that in my life for myself. So 
when those critical thoughts and judgments and all of the harsh words are ruminating in your head, learn to replace them with an I am statement. It can be anything. Whatever works for you. Whatever you feel like you need. And it helps to remain, reframe your mindset and foster the self-compassion. I am compassionate. I am self-compassionate. I am full of self-love. I mean, the, the possibilities are endless, guys. Y'all can, you can say I am whatever you want to. And if you say it enough times, you feel it enough times, you write it down enough times, whatever, it becomes part of your reality. Practicing self-compassion. Now it says be kind to yourself. Now this goes to the fourth agreement. The fourth agreement in the four agreements. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, it's a book by Don Miguel Ruiz called The Four Agreements. It's like the cornerstone of my practice. The fourth agreement is always do your best. And you know I've talked about that a little bit before, but always doing your best is knowing that your best is all you ever can do. Even in the times where you look back and you're like, man, that was terrible. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I was that person. You were doing your best at that point. I was an alcoholic for three years. And in that three years, I was doing my best to cope with the life that I had created at that point. And so even in my darkest moments, I was doing my best. And because I was doing my best, I give myself grace. And again, turn that into great or gratitude because that contributed to who I am today. Without that, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be who I am. So I'm thankful for it. When you make mistakes or experience failure, practice the same kindness and understanding for yourself that you would offer a friend. How many times does somebody say, man, I can't believe I did that. And you're like, man, it's okay. Stuff happens. It's okay. Well, you'll get past this. But then when we do something, we're like, I can't believe you did that. I'm never going to get past this. I can never forgive myself. You know, and then we, we lie to ourselves. We lie to our family. We lie to people in our lives or whatever as a method of coping. But again, you're doing your best. But the, the only way to start creating what you want is to become aware of these things in your own life, in your head, in your beliefs, in your emotions, all of it. Instead of blaming yourself, recognize that mistakes are a part of growth and learning. Without mistakes, you don't grow. You have to make mistakes to grow. Now, I, I do believe that your mistakes get less impactful in a negative way as you grow, but ultimately you still need them. You're still gonna make mistakes. I've made two or three mistakes. Um, up here talking, <laughs> you know, and y'all probably aren't aware of them, but I am, but I'm not over here like, oh my gosh, I, I, I need to just shut up because I messed up. That wouldn't help. And embrace your humanity. Understand that everyone experiences challenges, setbacks, and insecurities. You're not alone in your struggles, and it's okay to feel vulnerable or imperfect at times. Vulnerability, again, facilitates intimacy. If you're able to be vulnerable with the people in your life, it's going to do nothing but contribute to that relationship. And the reason we're not vulnerable is because we're afraid of what the other person will think or what they, how they will react. And so you've got a responsibility to be vulnerable, but you've also, on the other side of that, you have a responsibility to, if someone's being vulnerable with you, receive that in a way to where your reaction doesn't make them want to not be vulnerable anymore. You know, we're all in this together. Learning to love yourself takes time. Be patient. Embrace yourself. You are worthy and you are infinitely loved. And if you don't believe that, if you don't believe there's anyone in your life that loves you, I can tell you right now that I do. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you come from, what you've done. I love you. And that's all the people that are out there watching this too. So that's the end of my presentation. Now, Mystics of Texas is where we're at for all those online watching. If you're looking for a spiritual home with thought provoking topics and loving people, We'd love for you to come join us in person. We meet every Sunday at 115 here in Karnak, Texas. And you can find more information at mysticsoftexas.com. Thanks for listening, guys. Love y'all.